I'm Justin Laws. Um, basically, uh, polyamory defined is just long-term committed, multiple relationships with uh, consenting adults. And uh, the way I came about it was I, I grew up in a, in a really um, a family with a lot of turmoil, <laughs> where my parents didn't love each other, and I didn't. I grew up, and I just didn't really think it was a, a, a way to be. I didn't want to be that person. And, and any, any family I've ever been around was like the same thing in my neighborhood. It was a really low-income poverty neighborhood. But uh, when I discovered polyamory, I, I mean, it opened up all, all kinds of uh, new doors for me, and I've been really excited about it. And uh, of course, I've only been practicing for a few months now, though. <laughs> so um, also. Um we're at the Alt Expo, if for those who aren't familiar with what the Alt Expo is, um, it's an exposition of alternatives that you might not see at, um, at uh, Pork Fest in general, at, at the uh, events that, um, that, that are going on otherwise. Um, so, I mean, that's basically what the Alt Expo is right now. Um, and um, let's see, uh, what, am I, what am I forgetting? I'm Nick Ford, I'm co-organizing the Alt Expo. Um, I organized a few talks here, and I'm doing other organizing too, doing way too much. Um, and, uh, and I also helped organize this event with Justin Laws. Um, and so um, our speakers, we're going to have four different speakers, well we're going to have like sort of panel thing. Um, Rob right here, he's, uh, he has a few years of experience with uh, polyamory. <laughs> Um, and uh, and we got Ross here. He's got a few. Uh, he's got a bit bit of experience as well. <laughs> I, I don't know the resume, so I'm just going. I'm just going down by what they told me. And Stephanie, I can give a kind of good resume for Stephanie. She she does pork therapy. Um, and, and Ethan, um, I I thought Ethan might be interested in. He has some experience as well. So very loosely organized. I apologize. So th th those are our speakers. Um, yeah, so you guys can get started. We we thought. Um, we thought we could talk about, or you guys could talk about what polyamory means to you, and your experiences, if you want to share them, you don't have to share them, um, and whether you think it's related to libertarianism at all, um, which I think is interesting, whether you think it has anything to do with libertarianism or it's just something in of itself that should be valued or not valued or whatever, um, and so that's, that's the gist. So if anybody who wants to start, you can start. Can I start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, for me, I think that this is what my podcast is about, and this is something that really interests me, the concept of applying the principles of freedom and liberty to personal relationships. And I think that as libertarians or people who love freedom, we can all relate to the non-aggression principle, you know, don't, don't perpetrate for force or fraud on someone else. And I think that a lot of people don't think about that in terms of applying it to personal relationships. They think, you know, okay, don't hit someone, don't steal things, but it actually does apply to personal relationships. And if we, if we start out talking about fraud, fraud is, you know, lying, not keeping agreements. That's something that happens, you know, so commonly in this society, especially with this idea that all relationships should be modeled after a traditional um, monogamous heterosexual marriage. And I think that there are definitely some people who don't fit well within that mold or who don't fit within that mold at certain times in their lives, and they, they feel very confined by that model, and so, um, you know, it leads to a lot of bad things, like cheating and lying, and essentially what is fraud, which is a violation of the non-aggression principle. Um, and if we look at force, I think that there are also some people who do use force in their personal relationships. We can all think of the obvious example of uh, domestic abuse, and physical violence, but there's certainly a lot of emotional type violence and manipulation and uh, ignoring and things of that nature that go on within the context of relationships too. So if we think about applying the non-aggression principle directly to personal romantic relationships, I think that uh, neither of those things, not initiating force or fraud, is incompatible with the concept of having multiple loving relationships at once. I would say that you know, my ethical caveat would be that there has to be openness and honesty between everyone who's involved, and consent is completely uh, paramount in those situations. Um, yeah, I guess I'll let other people jump in. That's that's my philosophy of romantic relationships, and that's <laughs> that's compatible with monogamy, polyamory, any style that anyone wants to have in their relationship. I just think that. You know, as people who love freedom, it's uh, it's completely okay for us to consider 
the possibility that there could be many different alternative styles of relationships and everyone should kind of feel free to model their own uh, however fits them best mm -hmm. and however everyone consents. Subjective value in relationships. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more thing that reminds me, Ethan. So Ethan made kind of an economic parallel. I promise I'll stop talking after. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a great job. Please. <laughs> Um, Ethan brought up kind of an economic um, concept of subjective value in relationships. And um, I think that uh, a lot of people think of m relationships, especially monogamous relationships. We're taught that monogamy is the kind of the default in society. I think that a lot of people think of it as kind of one person having a monopoly on someone else's heart or of their, their body or their, you know, emotional spirit or whatever, what have you. But, you know, I think that if we apply libertarian principles to our relationships, if someone, if you, if you do grant someone a monopoly over your heart, it should be a market monopoly because they're meeting all of your needs effectively, if that makes any sense. God. Economism. That is a monopoly, though, but okay. <laughs> I, uh, sure, and, I, and, you know, for some people, they don't want to give anyone a monopoly over their heart, and I think that's perfectly acceptable as well, but... Yeah. I'll, I'll dovetail off of that. I, I came to that same conclusion about Monopoly, too. I never liked the idea of... Um, and as, as I grew up, uh, I had a, my first serious relationship when I was about 17. Uh, I became somewhat possessive and kind of jealous. And, and as that relationship <laughs> fell apart, and uh, no small part because of that, I, I came to realize that the idea of owning someone and trying to control their behavior, and uh, it's just a very bad model for relating to people and very unlibertarian. And so since then I've kind of developed and eventually discovered the, the ethical slut and began from there kind of all rolled down. So part of it is, is the libertarian idea of I don't want to own someone or control someone. I want to freely associate out of joy, not out of protection and control. Those are the, the ugly aspects of relationships. That's not even based on joy. And another aspect of it too that I quite like is, you know, I don't, I don't know how much time I have here too. I want to share lots of things with lots of different people. And I want to be open and honest about yeah. it too. I'm not trying to deceive anyone. It's not just about sex. Um, it's, I really want to share things with people and I think that's a really strong thing to do. Different experiences for, with different people. Absolutely. I, I, not, it's not right for everyone, but I think it's a very good way to organize your, your love life. Any questions? <laughs> I think they covered a lot of great ground. Um, actually, well, okay, we'll Go take first. a question, but we'll, we'll keep talking too. Okay, yeah. So whatever. Sure. All about like pleasure and joy and like excitement and things like that. But surely there's a lot of value in like loyalty and uh, I don't know, like sticking together too. Certainly, um, and that's where a lot of I think clear communication comes in about different needs and wants and boundaries and such between different partners. Yeah, I, I don't think that um, having multiple loving relationships uh, precludes intimacy or pre precludes connection or any of those things that I think almost everyone is looking for in a romantic relationship. Um, you know, I, I like to say that love is not a zero-sum game, and if we love one person, it doesn't mean we have less love to give other people. Um, it, time is certainly finite, of course, and I think if we do a thought experiment and each one of us thinks about, okay, do I have time in my life to date 10 people at once? N not many people would say yes and to have a meaningful, um, you know, intimate connection with each one of those people. But if you think about something like, uh, you know, this is not romantic love, but a parent that has two children. Do they love one child less because they, they have another one? No, I don't think so. I think it just multiplies the love. So. I definitely like to think of love in that way, that it's, it's not uh, a limited resource, and it's not something to be jealously guarded, you know, um, it, it can be multiplied through sharing. I know that sounds a little woo-woo, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that there's one more aspect that dovetails in with libertarianism and, and anarchism, and back to the popularized thing that humans aren't popular, that you can be mm -hmm. separate yeah. like that. And another thing is, um, um, Ross mentioned... Did, did you mention the ethical slot? You mentioned it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Ross mentioned it. Um, that is a fantastic book that uh, I had actually just finished two weeks ago after reading it a, a while ago before that. Um, and it's a great book for relationships in general. Um, and I really recommend it, not just for like polyamorous relationship, but um, I mean, I'm personally in a monogamous relationship. Um, but I enjoyed the book. It was it was really good. So um, if you're interested about polyamory and this talk doesn't do it for you, The Ethical Slut is a great book for that. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you said that, Nick, because um, 
I think there's a huge difference between a monogamous relationship where the partners are viewing each other as I, I own my partner or like they're they belong to me and ha 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 I'm gonna control them and if they do this then they will be punished. If they do this thing that I don't want them to do it's being people is what you can get from them as opposed to being people themselves. Sure, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there's a big difference between that where there's kind of an aspect of control and uh, authoritarianism and, and ownership in a relationship versus a relationship, even a monogamous one, where the partners are free to talk about whatever with their partner and free to be completely open about anything, uh, including things like, you know, being honest about all kinds of feelings, attraction to other people is is one that generally is like a taboo subject in most monogamous relationships. And there's a, a difference between the style of monogamy that allows for for that and the style that doesn't, that allows for more freedom, at least of, of expression. Mm -hmm. I think that monogamy has a lot to learn from polyamorous ideas, even if they remain monogamous. Absolutely. And I, and I think too, it, it's worth noting that even though um, some of us here may like polyamory more than monogamy or maybe more interested in it, you're certainly not saying that you should all be polyamorous or that <laughs> everyone everyone has to be polyamorous or monogamy is like tyranny or, or something like that. No, we're not saying that. Um, I just want to make that clear. Um, so you certainly can be monogamous. No one, I don't think anyone really in the poly community or at this panel at any rate would, would stop you. Uh, so I just want to make that clear. I had a question. Yeah, well, well uh, sort of question and comment. Sure. A uh, guy I know who has um, two partners. And he says when they work things out, it's not double the conversation, it's triple. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, does that uh, sound familiar? Or um, uh, because you have a new configuration that goes up exponentially, the number of conversation and things you work out with people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think everybody wants, um, wants to be heard and listened to in a relationship. Everybody wants connection and uh, intimacy. And when there are more people involved in a relationship, then, you know, as you said, the conversation gets multiplied because to meet everybody's needs for those things. So have, has any of you have the experience of it being in a uh, monogamous relationship and saying, well, this is not really quite fulfilling where I'm at. We need to have a conversation about the topic of polyamory for us. How did that open up and how did you open up that conversation with someone you traditionally had a monogamous relationship with? Um, did anyone do that? I, can, I, I did the opposite. I, I, I did. Um, I was in a, in a marriage. I started out for, um, in a very conventional uh, small mental box and uh, over time I came to learn that I was I had been programmed to behave in a certain very uh, sla slavish manner and uh, I'd gotten into a relationship while I was still in that state and uh, down the road uh, about five years I realized that I was um, I wasn't uh, living authentically with her and uh, the way I opened the conversation was by um, seeing that her needs weren't being met in the relationship and offering it as an option for her and letting it made known that I would be, you know, trying to express how completely, um, oh, not just, not just comfortable with it. I would tr want, wish to be, but that I, I desired her to, to meet her needs and to find what she needed to, to fulfill um, what it meant for her to be her fullest self. And, and I was, I was too scared to actually request it for myself. And uh, very s too too scared to really um, kind of go there. I think uh, yes. 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 And so I, I I put it out there, and it was immediately knocked down, and that's as far as I went with it. I I had somewhat a similar experience. I mean, I'm in a monogamous relationship, but I'm interested in polyamory to one extent or another, and I've had some discussions with my girlfriend about it, and you know we. We're at the point in our relationship where she's okay with, with most things, but some things she'll, she'd still want just between us. And I'm fine with that too. I mean, that goes back to the consent thing. It has to be, it has to be open and honest, and it has to be on a consensual basis. If we both like the terms and agreements, then it's fine. You know, I'm happy where I'm at. Even though it's monogamous, it's open to the point where I feel like I can still 
safely express myself, and she can too if she wants to. Voluntarianism in relationships. Yes, or just anarchism. You don't want to use voluntarism. Yeah, can I add something to that? Sure. Today? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> well, I, you might get it back. Um, <laughs> why, don't, why don't you speak first, sir? Oh, uh, I was just going to throw it out there. What do you guys think of swing and swing lifestyles? Is kind of what we're talking about. Should we just go down the go down the aisle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've never in my relationships we've never done that, but I'm not opposed to it. Um, from what I've been learning recently, uh, the, a lot of the swinger community has gotten a very bad reputation mm -hmm. as having done it, as having going into it from a closed off heart perspective, that they're not really authentically trying to connect with other people when they do this. And I'm finding out that that's maybe not at all true, mm -hmm. that it's just under a different, for a large portion of them, it's just they're limiting um, the amount of time uh, with these other couples that and they're limiting kind of just the duration so that uh, so that I, I think they can be more present so that the complications are less severe and so that you know the, a lot of the um, the more difficult insecurities to deal with don't come up as, as readily and that's 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 beautiful I, I think life is a school in love and everybody's at a different place and they need to honor where they're at and not move beyond it until they've learned what's what's at that level for them and there's multiple different paths for that. Mm. That was pretty well said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think swinging is definitely takes place in more of a sexual space than an emotional mm -hmm. space, um, like Rob said. Um, so there's certainly some overlap and I'd personally be somewhat interested in it, but I've never actively sought it yeah. out as of yet. Yeah. Um, for me it's not like something I'm personally into. I guess I wouldn't be opposed to it on any philosophical level if everyone fully consented, but I think Rob is right that this community does have kind of a bad reputation because I think there is this notion that people aren't trying to form uh, authentic connections and, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of gives all people who are um, maybe consider them, themselves polyamorous like this, this idea that it's all about sex or that they're just trying to get as many partners as possible, but I don't think that's that's true at all. And I don't know, like everything else that we just said, it's important to to get everyone's consent that's involved. Each polyamorous is a different individual, so they have different subjective values. Some are interested, some aren't, and mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that the reputation is mixed it up. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what mainly this talk is about, is that the reputation of people who have multiple lovers are seen as sluts or um, for men it's man whores or, or people who are using women um, or whatever. Uh, and this talk is kind of to see that there's another side of that other than just you know, ripping people's hearts out or, or whatever the hell, whatever, whatever's accused of. Um, I actually think that's anti-libertarian yeah. because it's basically not having regard for the feelings mm -hmm. of other people. Yeah. And I think none of us are about that on here. I don't know. Yeah. I can't speak for others. So, and so this is this talk is is uh, largely about um, making sure that people are aware of that people who may eng engage in multiple loving relationships aren't necessarily at it because they want more sex or or whatever. Yes. Can I, yeah, I just uh, I've lived in uh, polyamorous lifestyles for over thirty years, and I find it's just an amazing, gross experience. I mean, it's you know, talk about having to deal with your shit. Okay. <laughs> This is the crucible to do it in, and I don't. But the and, the and and the benefits are just amazing. Um, one of the things having being in the liberty movement, I see this this is all kind of a continuum because we look at the state as a monopoly. Okay, they're the only player you can deal with. Right, you must deal with us. You know, there's no competition. Well, to me, social relationships, you know, are, should be the same way. And romantic relationships, why should there be a monopoly? Well, this is the only person you can be with, and we, we will aggress against you if you. If, you know, it's like, what is this? You know. So I think it all kind of, you know, makes a whole piece. You know, liberty in all aspects of our lives. And uh, but it points out in, in in sharp relief, you know, when you're not being honest with people, and especially if you're not being honest with yourself. I, I think what you were saying about heart space is really important. And uh, I've met a lot of people who were just into a sexual space, but I've met a lot of people who were, you know, 
way beyond that, but weren't sure how to deal with it. You know, so we're all at different levels. I'm really glad that this is being discussed because this is, you know, this is another frontier of liberty. You know, that our culture you now needs to start exploring. So thank you for. Welcome. Uh, and I think on a smaller scale, um, uh, like people look at polyamory and they think, uh, some people think it's really a radical notion that you could love more than one person um, because they're so, not because they're necessarily um, afraid of it or, or something else, but they've never really heard about it and they, they look mostly at the monogamous culture that dominates um, today, which is another problem that monogamy is seen as the only option and like, you know, on TV, you know, you always see the cheating husband or the cheating the, the, the mistress or whatever, and it's all backhanded and, and you know, it, it looks very sneaky and stuff like that. But And then people look at polyamory and might associate with it. Um, so again, it's a reputation thing. Um, so yeah, that, yeah, I think when people are cheating in this, in this culture that's monogamous by default, that's what I like to call it, yeah. clearly they have some need in that relationship that's not getting met. Yes. But yeah. they don't feel that there's any way to get that met within the uh, confines of the monogamous model. And so they feel like they have no choice but to to lie or to evade or to, you know, kind of go outside the relationship surreptitiously. And in that case, they're using kind of a costly strategy to get their needs met, which it, is really unfortunate. Yeah, it is. And, and I can kind of see a parallel. It's like prohibition. It's, yeah. <laughs> I can kind of see a parallel in, like, in like political ideologies, like when people are... are like for example like if you're like seeing the state as like illegitimate or something and you might like go down like a, a really weird path or like a weird because you're so stuck in the mainstream paradigm of well i mean the state's so big and the state's so massive and everyone you know seems to really enjoy it or, or really accept it how could i you know how could i ever, ever do it so some people might resort to violence or some people might resort to um things that we as anarchists might not necessarily prove of although the media would clearly say otherwise um, but yeah, I mean, I, th I, draw, I would draw parallels in political theory too. Uh, there's this guy up here. Yeah. Go ahead. There's one other aspect of the, the swinging community I'd like to address, and that's sure. uh, I've really harshly judged them in the past and stayed, you know, kept a, tried to keep a distance from it because I was just scared about what sort of people I would meet there and, and how shallow they would be. And, and from what I've been learning lately is that there are a lot of people there that the reason they they go there is because they have long-term relationships they've developed with other couples mm -hmm. and they come back and meet each other regularly for years and years on end and in addition a lot of the reason why they they pursue that model is because that's kind of the only outlet out there for people to get together which is really sad right now mm -hmm. and there's also it's also a way that you can take care of this one really difficult aspect of, of polyamory which is is um, an, I think until people have reached a certain state of personal evolution, there's a there's a there's a real difficult spot around maintaining balance um, between partners and, and communication. And when you have the person you've loved and you've been living with for years there by your side all the time, when you're in connection with another couple that also share the similar thing, it it uh, ensures there's there's going to be that the balance is going to be easier to maintain and that the people will feel that they are in more of an equal communication relationship. So, so yeah, my apologies to any swingers here for having <laughs> judged you. Would um, you say it's arisen more spontaneously then out of uh, different interests that they first gathered under? The, they the gather because... No, um, no, they together because there's a swinging party, and that's hey, that's where <laughs> that's where these people go who are you know who don't seem to follow the norm. You know, the polyamory meetups. Where are they? They're not not yeah, too many. How many people come? Handful. Yeah. We what do they do? The, yeah. a lot of the time they they appear to be quite you know unfree actually mm -hmm. inside themselves. Yeah, in the town I live in, we've been struggling to actually get a meetup going for a while now, but. Uh, it's sometimes we, we, the places we go to, people have asked us, or is that a swinging party? I'm like, no, mm -hmm. a swinging party. <laughs> or maybe yeah. you should start advertising as right now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or, why not advertise as poly swinging? Yeah. And poly, or just everything. You know, anyone who's interested in actually in exploring liberty lived mm -hmm. in their personal life, which is really, I mean, until we can figure that out on an individual basis and a tribal basis and a small village basis, we, what? What, what real purpose do we have in going farther than that out in the the outside world politically? 
if you can't live it in your own little community, what do we have to show anyone else? You know? I'll take a question. You had a question? Sure. There's, there's a lot of attention uh, about how the formal legal system poses challenges for homosexual relationships, everything from parental rights to joint property ownership, tax filing, uh, health care issues. Is, uh, does anyone have first or secondhand experience about uh, polyamorous lifestyles having difficulties navigating our legal environment with these? Anyone can answer this, but if you have experiences, you, you guys... I don't have personal experience, but I've heard Canada's making some progress there and that uh, polyamory legal oh, rights yeah, are kind yeah, of like the next too. front. You know, it's going to become a very big issue very soon if it isn't already, you know, in many different countries. Is there anybody else? My, well, yeah, I mean, boy, that is a big hot button. Um, my ex-wife almost got our granddaughter taken away from her her daughter for speaking out on a television show about polyamory. You know, I mean, you know, the, the state loves to get at you with your children because they're, oh, that's an unfit home. And the funny part about it was we were on a television show to support this other triad who it was two, two gentlemen and a lady and it was her daughter but neither of the two gentlemen, it was his son, it was her ex-husband these things get complicated sometimes. <laughs> but it, was, it was the father's mother, the kid's grandmother, that saw her and her two husbands on a television show and got outraged. And she called the authorities and had the child taken out of their home. And for no other reason than they're disobeying the state. So yeah, it's, you know, you've got to watch, very be very careful, especially if you have children. In, um, in the ethical slot, and this is third-hand knowledge, I guess you would call it, um, they, they, they do talk a little bit about, um, they sort of compare it a little bit and contrast with what gay activists sort of are talking about. Um, yeah, with, with people who try to have polyamorous relationships in some states, I believe it, and I, I'm not you know, an expert or anything, but it might be actually illegal, um, or at least frowned upon by the authorities. Because um, like, like uh, Stephanie was saying, it, it's sort of... Uh, monogamy by default culture and that's that's another reason why this talk is because you know it's not it shouldn't be this way it shouldn't be monogamy by default there should be options for people who want to live like they want to live as long as it's voluntary and peaceful yes um isn't there like an emotional intelligence piece to this as well like as we've seen in inner cities and in more impoverished areas you have like baby fathers and baby mothers and like a loose family unit um not like, you know, maybe, like, what am I trying to say? Like, maybe if you aren't evolved enough as a person, like, to get into a polyamorous relationship, you, you have to get over jealousy, um, insecurities, all, all kinds of things. Um, like, I think question. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Can I build on that yeah. a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, there's... I, I don't support the use of, of force or coercion to establish a particular family model to remove kids from their parents or anything, but there is serious statistical correlation between having exactly two parents in the home and having a low rate of crime for kids when they grow up. Uh, it's, it's worse when you have less than two parents, you know, having parents be out of the home, be trading their time with multiple households, or just be you know, dead or, or in jail, but, uh, I mean, do you think there's a point at which when kids are involved, maybe the polyamory needs to go down to a swinging level and the two people need to stay in the home and, and be with their kids and well, not mix just, it up with Just that. to clarify your question, you don't have any studies involving multiple more than like like three parents in the home or anything like that to base. I don't know of any studies on like that, that specifically. Right. Yeah. I, Would I you be interested? I think there have been some actually okay. that that have looked into the the quality of life for the children in homes where there's <coughs> multiple parents that that are in you know kind of a harmonious relationship mm -hmm. and they're finding that it is a beautiful way to, what, to what raise about kids. I do what know about parents I leaving the home to to you know to, to divide their time with multiple partners besides the the other parent of the child. I guess I think that happens really often in conventional monogamous by default relationships because divorce is so common mm -hmm. and uh, you know people divorce and remarry and all that and uh, there was actually a book that was written in the 70s that kind of chronicled this family 
who had, you know, it was a polyamorous family and they had children. And basically what the children said about their childhood when they grew up was that we just had more love, like, in our life. And to me that was really beautiful, and I think that probably is the ideal situation. Now, there are a lot of monogamous parents that raise children in less than ideal ways, for sure, but I think the key aspects, no matter how many parents there are for a child, is that do they love the child, are they considering the child's needs and wants, and are they are they basically not using force or fraud or violence on the kid? And, and, and I just want to jump in on that and, uh, and say that your concern is definitely valid. Um, and I, I don't think any of us are trying to like downplay it or anything. And there are real ways to address it. I mean, you could conceivably, if it really does pose a problem to the child, if the parents really care about the child, then they might have a different living arrangement with, with their lovers or with the people they care about. There are ways to address this problem. And I just want to say that. I don't want to say, like, you know, if you run into this problem, there's no... Also, with the jealousy thing, um, there are ways to address that, too. I mean, you will have these problems in monogamous relationships, but then you could say, well, it's multiplied with polyamory. Yeah, it's multiplied. Uh, and it's, it's difficult. It certainly is. And this is why it's not for everyone. Some people are just jealous and will remain jealous, and that's fine. Um, you don't have to change yourself. If you feel natural with monogamy, then you stay with uh, monogamy. All we're saying is that there are other options. There are, there are alternatives out there if you're willing to try them. If you're not willing to try them, then and you're comfortable where you are, it's peaceful, it's voluntary, have at it. I, you, you can go ahead yeah, if you'd like. I, I just wanted to say that I, I've recently heard about this uh, study result on swingers, and if they apparently, from what I heard, don't quote me, it was like their average marriage lifespan was 23 years. What, compared, long? yeah, compared to like <laughs> the peak divorce rate mm -hmm. traditionally being around the four or five year mark. So if divorce is hard on kids, then that I, I just can't see how it would, especially, and, and you're talking about swingers who are going out, you know, to other couples in other areas, you know, spending their time outside of the home. They, they make time for that to happen. And I think the same thing would happen in most college homes. I, I can speak to that. I know several people who grew up as children in households where there were more adults than, uh, than, the, than the conventional nuclear family. And their experience was, you know, yeah, they got different people to talk to, and it's like, you know, more love from the standpoint, you know, but it's like every, every person, every adult brings something different into a family. So, you know, well, my one daddy knows all about this, my other daddy knows all about this, and, you know, so it's like they, it's all good, you know. And, uh, but it's true, I mean, just because you have multiple partners doesn't mean your life is idyllic. I mean, obviously, if people have problems, and, you know, uh, and, and there are issues where, you know, child abuse and stuff, and that, that, that has to be dealt with for sure. Yeah. So I just want to add something. Uh, we're going to go to 4.30, and then we'll probably call it, um, since we're getting a lot of questions. I wasn't sure how popular this would be or not, uh, but I'm glad to see that a lot of people showed up. So we'll go to 4.30, and then I think John Cannell will do a talk, maybe? Sure. I'll give uh, all right, he'll give a talk on... Um, ball uh, therapy. Ball therapy. Tennis ball. Tennis ball, ball therapy. Fantastic. Um, so that's what, uh, Ross, you wanted to say something. Sorry. We, we keep hovering around the issue of jealousy, and that's probably a very important topic to address yeah. before we leave. Yeah. I'm sure you're yeah. sitting there, if this is new to you, saying, I'd be jealous, or my significant other, or one of them would be jealous. Uh, I recently had my first polyamorous relationship, where we were, it kind of borders on dating too, but we were open to meeting other people, and we did. Uh, I was out of the country for a month, and um, during this time, I was kind of pursuing uh, interests I had in other people too. When I got home, um, the, the woman I was seeing said that she she had been with someone when I was away and very briefly like my nostrils flared and I had like that evolutionary <laughs> psychology where I'm like who's that got all caveman yeah. and, then, yeah. and then I just was like this is what I signed up for and I'm doing this too and I should extend the same courtesy to you and so it is even if you acknowledge it's the rational part of your brain it's sort of like the reptilian uh, hard wiring in your brain like you're gonna you might react a little bit but you have to train yourself to be like this is the way that I want to live, and this is how I want to treat others, and I hope that this same thing is being extended to me, and it was. Yeah. And I don't know how all of you have dealt with the jealousy issues, but I think that's pretty central. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you, you had a question earlier, didn't you? Well, yeah. I mean, it relates to the jealousy issue, right okay. for, at least from my perspective. Um, I, something that I see missing from the culture that we're uh, composting right now um, is non-sexual physical contact. That it's like, we un right, we understand, that, yes. we understand that 
one-year-olds need physical contact that isn't sexual. Right. And the way that I and a number of people that I know see it is that need doesn't disappear as we get older. It just gets channeled into a culture saying the only way to be physically close with someone is through sex. Or maybe joining the wrestling team. Co-ed <laughs> 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 wrestling team. Right. So <laughs> what I'm aiming for is a culture where there's, I, I think jealousy, in my experience, can, and I, I haven't been in polyamorous sexual relationships, but just seeing people together doesn't uh, raise as much in me. If I've been hanging out with friends where we're hugging each other a lot, or where people take a nap in a pile on the couch after lunchtime, um, or wrestling is also great. It doesn't have to be passive or, or sort of calm and quiet. So I wonder how, to, to me that's like uh, an integral part of sort of wellness, and I wonder how that relates to your experience. That's, I've experienced the same thing where I had a girlfriend going on a date with a guy I didn't even know, and like Ross here, I went, uh, but uh, another time she told me she had slept with this other guy and she's been seeing him. I was like, oh, I know that guy. He's awesome. And I had no, no flair, no nothing. It was like, if I, if you, it's like strangers, you know, you, see, you don't know them. If you're not comfortable with that person. Have you, have, have you heard of the cuddle party movement? Yeah, yeah, the cuddle party movement. I, I'm trying to get to a point where I can host cuddle parties at my community. There's a whole structure for creating a yeah. container for this to happen. And it's not simple because we're dealing with a traumatized society where boundaries are not really understood, where no comes along with a lot of baggage. So there's, for, for brilliant people like you who are willing to push the envelope, there's a huge demand for that sort of container for people. And it's a therapy that is going to change the world because the reason they're able to keep us down is because we're so scared of each other and part of that's due to the lack of physical contact. I've also had what they're talking about, that little initial response come up around another partner, but there's a flip side to that. I got to know the guy a little bit and found out he was this, he seemed to be this wonderful guy I could fall in love with too, <laughs> on a, nice. on a, as, as far as I can go, right. level at this point. And, and then I found out that he didn't, um, he wasn't at the level where he could really kind of read another person's um, energy, you know, and that I wasn't going to be able to probably get to experience that, that relationship with him. And there was a loss that kind of came there, like, oh. I'm going to have to wait for this brother to get a little farther. So it can go both ways. Yeah, I'd like to address this, the, 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 uh, the jealousy thing, because yeah. to me it's all about fear. <clears throat> okay, because you mentioned being afraid, and I think that's the key element of this. <clears throat> Once we get in touch with our own fear and realize, hey, what are we afraid of, and start really peeling all that apart, uh, I know jealousy in me and my poly relationship work like this, okay? If I was really in love with a partner, I wanted her to have all that she wanted. I wanted to have as much juice out of life as she could get. And having her enjoying herself, doing whatever she was doing with whoever she was doing with, that lit me up because it's like, she's having a great time. I love her. She's having a great time. This is as good as it can get. Compression. And she re respected that in me and said, wow, why would I want to leave this guy who's given me all this space? So the more space I gave her, the tighter our bond became. It wasn't like jealousy, like, oh, I'm you know, losing my energy. No, it's like it's building the energy, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think I, I think as libertarians... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just saying, yeah, I experienced that to some degree, too. I'll talk more about it, but go ahead. I think as libertarians, like, we're all about not using force on anyone, and if, uh, if you apply that principle to your personal life, what you want to do in a relationship is create sort of a space, like make yourself a beacon where your partner wants to spend time with you mm -hmm. and doesn't do so out of any obligation or because they feel forced, just genuinely wants to um, connect with you. And uh, some people describe this feeling of joy or happiness at seeing the joy of a partner or someone that uh, you truly love and care about. And that's been called uh, compersion. Yes. Yes. Compersion? Yes. Yeah, compersion. It's a word. It's a made up, yeah, it's a made it's up word. It's a really word. good word. It's on uh, Wikipedia. You can find the word on Wikipedia. Yes. So. Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, and it's, ultimate it's arbitrator of knowledge. The experience of delight in another's pleasure. Yes. When you're not the one involved with it. Yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah. There's a dark side to it, though, as well. Um, if you know that this other person you're in love with is not getting all their needs met, and you can see that they might be able to have a more joyous life if they were able to open up to another relationship but you're not, not seeing that they're not ready for that yet and that there's fear there, and then you kind of 
overly encourage them to to be free your your desire for compersion will 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 devastate your relationship because you will be in essence mm -hmm. initiating force on this other person emotionally they will perceive it as force because they're not you know they're not ready to go down that road yet no you're absolutely right it's perception is really important and it is force because you're not you're you're putting your own interests for things to be a certain way over the way that things really are, which is, yeah. which is perfect. Yeah. What Rose, Marshall Rosenberg talks about with uh, nonviolent communication, to speak according to your needs and, and understand them more, and having the skills to be able to see where you're coming from, what your needs are, and drawing that out in others in a way that's not coercive, you know, really smooth the relationships between you and encourage another side of you to develop that you were maybe timid in exploring. Right? I think there's there's a natural inclination with us to uh, connect with other people in all kinds of ways. And we're afraid that you know it's going to screw up what we've got going now, right? And it could could very well enhance it as many people experience. Um, I want to add that um, not all polyamorous relationships, of course, are like glamour stories or anything <laughs> like that. Um, yeah. I just don't want it to come across yeah, that we're day. all s saying like once you're polyamorous it all works out fine. No, it's a lot and a lot and a lot of work even if you're not even completely open. Uh, and I know that from experience, um, trying to be with other people even like through cuddling and stuff like that can be difficult if communication isn't open and all the people aren't known, which is really important. You really should introduce your partner to the other person that you want to interact with on that deep level because if they don't know them, if they don't know what's going on, there's really going to be a lack of communication between the first two people. And I learned Not that only first half, but the, unkno the unknown of that person as to any fear that might exist. Exactly, before. yeah, that's exactly it. So we're, um, we have five minutes left, so any more questions? Let's, let's address questions. Yes? Uh, related to the comment about Marshall Rosenberg, um, some of us are considering doing, putting together a panel about restorative justice and nonviolent communication mediation. Um, and I'm just curious, since, since it seems like a core part of working through this, yeah. if, if that happened, how many folks might be interested in going to a panel? Hello. And um, have, have you all used the um, forum technique developed at SAG at all? Not SAG familiar. is a polyamorous SAG. community in uh, I think they moved to Portugal, but, or maybe they're still in Germany. But they developed. They, they were they were on the, all this baggage and issues coming up, so they developed their own technique for working through it as a polyamorous community. It is an amazing communication technique for anyone. They have a their sister, their their daughter community is in Portugal now. It's Tamara. It's revolutionary. What's it, what's it called? Tamara. The first, um, one the first one is Zag, and it's Germany, and it's older, and they're they're incredible too, and they've pioneered so much. And I personally want to continue. I think that's where the revolution is, is creating these hot spots all around the country where people are operating freely in kind of a tribal environment. Anyone here is interested in helping me create that here in New Hampshire, let me know and check out hometreedomes.com. We're trying to create an, you know, an open um, initial uh, village, small little eco-village environment there, and then expand out. It's a Another one to search for is Friends Without Borders. Friends Without Borders. And uh, these also, um, to relate it back to political theory, um, it, it, these uh, could also be referred to as uh, temporary autonomous zones. So like, for example, Porkfest actually, some degree, I think is a, is a TAZ, uh, temporary autonomous zone, because we're more or less away from most of the, the thugs of the state, uh, and more or less, you know, property rights are being voluntarily acquiesced to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I won't get into all the details because that's kind of off to the side, um, but it's it's kind of cool to note that Porkfest could kind of be seen as a temporary autonomous zone. So um, and that's what Rob is talking about here. And well, yeah, if we can yeah. just manage the the boundary of that TAZ, you know, and, and it's again, gonna come down. They're gonna attack it. Can we move it? Can we can we learn how to adapt and flow around them and just gradually expand that zone until it's the whole world? And, and again, if you don't know what TAZ is, Wikipedia that shit because. <laughs> yeah, Wikipedia is awesome. That's the, actually the main message of the talk. I just there's another temporary autonomous zone right after this. It's at Firefly, I think in Vermont. It's a lot of the people that go to Burning Man, creating their own 800 plus village in the woods. 
and then Burning Man would also be considered another temporary tunnel yep, zone, but that's sure. 40,000 people, and so I haven't been there a, yet. We got a few minutes, so any last questions? We only have a few minutes left, so any last questions? Yep. Okay, or or statements, whatever. Not, not so much a question, yeah. Just, um, I've been, you know, sort of identifying as a polyamorous for some time, you know, and um, the Bay Area, San Francisco, where I'm from, has a pretty strong polyamory community, so we're pretty fortunate that way. Um, I'm a, uh, an erotic service provider, a, a sex worker, um, so it, it tends to fit right in with what I do, and I, I feel that it, you know, was really sort of a natural thing for me, but um, I realize that, you know, most of my relationships still, you know, even with people that, um, you know, sort of identify as poly or, or are open to it, like jealousy does come up, and, and someone here mentioned, I heard when I was walking up the book, The Ethical Slut, um, chapter 13 of that book is about jealousy, and I, I really recommend that. Uh, as a, a, a good um, exploration of that topic from a polyamorous perspective. Um, kind of what I, I found on a personal level is that, um, you know, it, it matters if, if to me if, you know, the partner or person I'm with uh, wants to be with some, I mean, I'm totally fine with if, if they're wanting to be with somebody who, who is, you know, in that mindset, in the polyamorous mindset. You know, what, what I've run up against blocks sometimes is if I think, you know, the person doesn't really feel that way. Like, if they're still operating from a possessive jealousy mindset, then I don't feel as comfortable about sharing with them. Um, and that's, you know, it's like kind of a simultaneous thing in some sense. Like, if we can all sort of start breaking down these jealousy possessiveness barriers uh, within ourselves and, and open up to this, you know, free love. Because mathematically, I mean, you know, it really makes more sense. We can all get greater enjoyment, I think, and satisfaction out of being with people if, you know, everybody isn't trying to, like, monopolize one person that they're with, you know. <laughs> um, the other thing that I found out was, you know, sometimes, um, you know, especially if it's somebody that is, uh, like I said, you know, more in a possessiveness, jealousy mindset, or at least not polyamorous, being with somebody that I'm in some sort of relationship with. Um, that I was more uncomfortable with it if it was like taking place in my presence. Whereas if I wasn't physically there, then I could, you know, be fine. It's like, hey, you know, go have fun. It's not, it's no skin off my back, right? You know, I mean, I'm not going to be there anyway to spend time with the person I care about. So what does it matter? She's, you know, doing something with someone else. Um, so there's a couple, I don't know. So um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and I'd like to thank the panelists for agreeing to come up here at this haphazard scheme that went really well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> this was literally organized two days ago, so keep that in mind. Uh, thank you.